I served in the Korean War. What was your branch of service? I was a private E2. And what was your branch of service? I was in the Army. And what general locations did you serve? I served in Korea. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted, but I was enlisted. I volunteered for the first draft that came along. I was in high school. And so I volunteered for the first draft that came along. The first draft came along was in August 1951. And so I became a enlisted draftee. So I was a U.S. instead of R.A. That means I didn't volunteer for the draft. I was in drafted in by the government. Where were you living at the time? You I was living in Stamford, Connecticut. Um, 56 Prefer Street. Were you just out of high school? Or were you I was in high school. I was in my last year in high school and when the draft came along I had to stop school and go into the service. So I entered into the service and into Massachusetts, Harlem, or Massachusetts and then I went to Fort Dix and then I put Dick, New Jersey for my basic training. And how long was your basic training? My basic training was 16 weeks. Do you recall any memorable moments? In yes, I had some good memories then. What to call them? Because I remember there was three George Brown in my company. George Brown was in the first Tune, George Brown was in the second platoon, and George Brown was in the third platoon. In the first platoon, there was George E. Brown. In the second platoon, which was me, was George W. Brown. In the third platoon was George Brown E. And we all went home. And the mother called one evening and said, I'm sorry to inform you, but George Brown just died. And so, by that Monday morning when I got back to Fort Dix, the company commander said, it's a good thing you came back, because if you didn't come back, we had to put you down for dead. So, it wasn't me. And it wasn't George in the first platoon because he was white and the other two of us were black. And so the one from Brooklyn, he was the one who died. I lived in no I lived in Stanford. George Brown George E. Brown, he lived in Brooklyn, and George Brown E, he lived in in Riverside, Connecticut. And so, when I went to get paid after the end of the month, red line through my name, DCs. Couldn't get paid. So it took me three months before they found out that I wasn't dead. But all the time I'm going, going through service, I'm taking my basic training and everything else. And finally, I finally got paid, but it was nice because I got back paid for it, everything and everything. So it was pretty good. Do you recall any of your instructors while you were in basic training? Um, no, too many years have passed. I don't remember them. I don't remember them. Um... But after a break of training, everybody in my outfit went to Germany. Every single person went to Germany except me. I didn't go because I volunteered to go to Korea. The war had broke out in Korea and I volunteered to go to Korea. And I ended up going to Japan. And when I got to when I got, I had to travel to to Seattle, Washington, and from Seattle, Washington, I shipped out to Osaka, um, Camp Drake, Japan, and from Camp Drake, Japan, 
I shipped to Korea. But when I got to Korea, when I got to Japan, I was signed to an outfit, the 24th Infantry Division, and they had just come back from Korea. And they were permanently signed to Japan since they just came back from Korea. And so I turned all my OD clothes because in Japan you don't wear winter clothes. You just wear summer clothes. So I got rid of all my winter clothes and I got my nice summer clothes. Now I'm going to be stationed there in Japan, have myself a good time. But after a month of that, I got pipeline saying, sorry, you volunteer for a career. You have to go to the career. So I was on a train heading for a career. And when I got to Korea, it was a whole new world. So did you go to Korea with that same unit or did you move to a new unit? A new know? unit. I went to the 3rd Infantry Division that just came over from Germany. They volunteered to come to Korea. Since they were the volunteer unit, I ended up with a volunteer company. So I end up with the 3rd Infantry Division. And when I got into the 3rd Infantry Division, I end up being in the Tank Corps. And the Tank Corps was nice, but you rode everywhere you went and way back behind the line. And so I didn't like that. That was not what I joined the service for. I joined the service to see what fighting was about. And so I opted out of the tank corps into the infantry. And when I got into the infantry, I became a machine gunner. And a machine gunner is another one where you're not up on line, you couple of hundred feet away and you fire on the enemy and then you move to another spot and you fire on the enemy and move to another spot. I didn't like that either. So I got out of the machine gun corps and I got into the infantry. There you were. But you have to meet new people all the time. You're meeting new people because in every situation, there's a group that learning this stuff. And so you're with this group and now you're out of this group and you're in with another group. So when I got with the infantry, I met five boys from, well, three from Detroit, one from California and one from New Jersey. I had to call them the three D boy, the big California, and the little short, the little short um, New Jersey boy. So we became not friends but brothers, and that's who I went up on line with. Those five men. I love them more than I loved it life. So when you first got to Korea, you were in the tank corps? And how, yep. how long did... I stayed in the tank corps for about um, two and a half months. And I stayed a machine gunner for about three months. And I spent the rest of my time on infantry men. So did you ever face any combat with either the tank corps or as a machine gunner? Nope. There were just tri trials and drills. Trials and drills. But in the, when I got to the infantry, where I got wounded, I got into the infantry and we kicked off one morning at 
6 o'clock in the morning. And our objective was to take this hill called Hill 117. Hill 117 is 117 meters high. And that was our objective to take that hill. So we had to cross the Imjim River to get to this hill. And the rain on us and the and uh, it was in August, and there was the monsoon season. That's when the river is three and four times higher than in the regular months. And so we had to cross the Emerson River, which was swelled up real high, and the rain rained on us. And uh, we had to use this combo wire to pull us up across over on the boats. And... Some tipped over, too much weight on them, and some drowned because of the weight they had on them with the with the flat jacket and the and the bandolier and and the rifle to carry it. Some drowned, and they were pulled out in the in the. And the calm, where the water is calm, way down about a mile down, down river. But you had to cross that river. And crossing that river was a, was the ordeal. Because after you got across, then you had to pull yourself up on this, up on this hill by the combo wire. And it's muddy and slippery. And some wanted to go, some couldn't go. Some heart was there, but the body wouldn't do it. And so they had to be sent back across the river again. And that went on all night long until dawn the next morning. After about seven o'clock, we were all across the river walking towards our objective. And we got to our objective about 12 o'clock. And about one o'clock, we assault the hill to take it. And we took it, and we thought we killed everything up there. And we thought everything was probably because it was calm and everything. Then all hell broke loose. Motor went off, artillery went off, and machine gun fire went off, and we were being hit. And that's when I heard my sergeant howling for help. He had a leg clean blown off. And I came from one side, another soldier came from the other side, picking him up on our shoulder to get him back out of harm way. And that's when I heard the machine gun, ta -ta -ta, ta -ta -ta -ta. so I assumed they were firing birth of three. And the soldier that had him on one side got three in the back. The sergeant got three in the back. I got one in the arm. And I was thrown about maybe a hundred yards downhill by myself. And now I'm down there. Can't get uphill. So um, thirsty. I'm hurting. But down there, the Imjim River right below me. So I crawled down to the Imjim River because I wanted to get something to drink. The Imjim River is, is fresh water. And so I get down to the river, and the jacket, the flag jacket, is too heavy for me. I can't carry that. So I take that off, and with the trenching tool, I bury, I sink it in the water. So it had grenades on it. So we didn't want no enemy to get those. And so then I start to try to make my way back up hill. And I'm walking, but my arm is dangling. I have to carry it with my left hand and carry my right hand. And I'm walking. And I'm the only one down there by myself. And so I figure, 
Well, maybe I'll call for my friends. The Detroit boys I told you about, the three of them, one was named Roy, James Roy Banks. He was a junior, a name after his father. So we used to call him Roy's boy. So he was light skinned. And so I was calling for Roy's boy. And I said, oh my God, I'm making all this noise down there. Post the enemy come. I said, but one thing, if they come, they're going to have to get the darnest fight that they can, but I ain't going to be taken. So I walk some more and I call some more. Finally, I see this little light face pop up. And I said, oh my God, now I got a fight. But it was Roy's boy. And he waved to me, keep walking, keep walking, keep walking. So I keep walking. Then after about uh, 20 minutes, I see the three of them. There was Bronson, there was Lipcomb, and there was Perry, Earl Perry. Earl Perry was the one from California. Lipcomb was the one from Jersey, and Bronson and Barker was the one from, from Detroit. They all came down to help me. And Bronson, he stand about six foot three. He want to carry me. I said, no, man, I can walk. Let me walk. No, 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 you're hurt. I got to carry you. I said, no, man, let me walk. I can make it. I'm all right. No, man, I got to carry I said, Roy, but will you tell Perry to put me down? Let me walk. He said, all right, put him down. Let him walk. And so we walk until we meet the rest of the outfit that's walking back off line. All the thing up there is finished. Now when we get there, my lieutenant, who was in charge of the of the whole shooting of the rain, he was shot with a piece of strap metal in the throat. He can't talk. And when we walking back across the river, there's a Greek outfit there. And they tell us to go back. Don't go further. Go back. That's all minded. That's all minded. Right? So they look at me. What should we do? I said, come on, man. We're going forward. It ain't too, too dangerous to go back. We got to go forward. And the uh, soldier we fought, I was as close as I am to you. I remember one soldier. He was close to me as to you. I saw them until I heard the ping in the rifle. When the ping in the rifle and it popped out, I just reached down to put another one in to do some more shooting. And then it was all dead and everything was calm and we start to walk back off the, off the line. That's when I got ran to get my sergeant and I got shot some way downhill and end up walking and meeting my rest of the friends. But across the river, the Greek officer told us to go back, but we ain't going back. So I said, come on. We went straight back, because that's where our objective was, to get back on the boat that way. So we got down there to where the boats were. We never seen our uh, motor went off. We never seen uh, any artillery come back after us at all. And so we got back and got across the Emgen River where the Jeeps were waiting for us, the Red Cross were waiting for us to take us where we need to go, the wounded and whatnot. I was one of them. So I ended up getting in this Jeep, and the Jeep took me to this, um, this um, Scandinavian hospital where they set my arm. And when they set my arm at the Scandinavian hospital, that when they shipped me from there to Osaka. And, <clears throat> so you said you were in a hospital in Osaka? Yes. How long were you there for? I was there for about eight, nine months. And? I left there. I left there and I ended up going to to California. Now it took us, it took 36 hours from Korea 
no, from Japan to California. We flew on a DC-34 a DC airplane. Well, no jets at that time. We were on a propeller plane, four propeller plane. And we landed in, in California. And from California, it took a, it took, it took a week. It took a week to fly from California to Massachusetts. We flew from California to, oh, to, um, North Dakota, from North Dakota to South Dakota, and from South Dakota, we flew to, to, um, Massachusetts. And then once you got to Massachusetts, was that your final? That was my final destination, where I stayed in two days. Um, they did me my skin graft on my arm. They did me a skin graft on my arm and reset the arm all over again and put the braces on the arm. And I had the tendon transplant done at, at Osaka, Japan. I mean, at, um, camp, at, um, Massachusetts, General Massachusetts. And I stayed there. That was home for me. That was home for me until August of 1953. But I was permanently sent home and I was discharged from home. So while you, you were in Osaka for eight to nine months, how yep. were you there for so long? Well, that was that, that was the, that was the rotation, waiting for the waiting for the waiting for the waiting to be shipped out. And did you stay in touch with your your outfit while you were in? The yeah, hotel? they wrote me. They wrote me. They wrote me. Perry used to write me regular. His letter would say, "Remember that hill we took last week." Well, they came back and took it again. But we're going back and we're going to take it again in the morning. And I got another letter saying they took it back. But we're going back again and we're going to take it again. And that's where the letter used to, to write. And he used to call me Sergeant. Sergeant, we're going to take that damn hill again in the morning. But you know, they take it in the morning, we take it at night. They take it at night, we take it in the morning. <laughs> and I missed it, my friends. Still do. So were you awarded the Purple Heart in the hospital or after you had separated? After I separated. And can you tell me about the days when you separated? When I was, when I was, and uh, when I was in the um, when I was in the hospital, I was in the hospital. Hospital was home. All right, I went home to my home for a visit. Right, I went back to the hospital home. One day, I was moping around in the hospital, and the uh, doctor said. Brown, look like you need a vacation. How about going home? I said, I'm already home. He said, no, man, I'm talking about going home, your home. I said, all right, I don't mind that. He said, well, how long would you like to go? I said, well, how long can I get? I'll take a month. He said, that's all you want? I said, no, how long can I get? He said, you can get three months. I said, give me the three months. So I went home for 90 days. Home was no joke. My first week in home, I go to the movies. And I'm dressed real nice in my civilian clothes, brand new, everything, everything. And I 
get in the movie at quarter to three. The path of the palace theater. Three o'clock. I'm in the police station. Quarter to three. I get to the movie, get my ticket up, go sit down. And the usher come by and say, all right, you, 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 you're out of here. You're out of here. Right? And there was kids sitting in front of me, right? Young high school kid in front of me, right? So they get up to leave, right? So I'm sitting there, right? I ain't no teenager now. I done been to hell, almost lost my life, and now I'm back home. I'm sitting up there enjoying a movie. And he said, didn't you hear what I said? I said, you out of here. I look at him, and then he went to grab me. When he went to grab me, I threw him three rows over. He got up off the floor and went running to the office. When he come back, there were cop cars, cops all over the place, right? They grabbed me, dressed me up and everything, and took me to the police headquarters. That was on Bank Street at the time, where the police station was. And so I sat down. I didn't do anything. I haven't been in the in the theater about 15 minutes. What can I have done? Right? So they said to me, well, you were charged with resisting arrest, disturbing the peace, disturbing the peace, and, and, and all this all the conduct. I said, all that in 15 minutes? I said, I got in the theater at three quarter to three. Look at the time. It's just three o'clock. And I'm in the police headquarters. I said, if you let me make a phone call, we can clear this up. The sergeant said, you'll make a phone call when I let you. All right. So... I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there, I'm in this, I'm not in, in a jail, I'm in this pen, this cage pen, all right, sitting there, right? And so, finally about six o'clock, he said, you can make a phone call, who do you want to call? I said, I want to call Murphy General Hospital in Massachusetts. His mouth kind of dropped down. You want to do what? I said, yes, I want to call Murphy General Hospital and come down and have, have somebody come down here to get me from the hospital. Then he found out that I'm a disabled veteran. All right. Now they all want to be apologetic and whatnot, but they're going to let me know. I'm not leaving until somebody from the hospital come here from me. And the captain comes down. Right? Now, you know, four hours from there to there, all right? Now it's 10 o'clock. Right? And the captain gave them holy hell. Said, Brown, tell me you're hurting somewhere. This tell you hurting somewhere. And we will have this dog on police station in so much trouble they won't be able to breathe. I said, no, I'm all right. Let's get me out of here and get me back to the hospital. All right. Now I only I had 30 days, but I've only been home. Three, because I got home and the, and the weekend come, and now I'm in jail, all right? So they take me back to the hospital and said, we're going to do a f full physical on you and see what happened. They took all the names from the police officers and whatnot, whatnot. And when I got back, I'm all right and everything. 
But my joy was when he grabbed me, where he went. All right. So that happened that time. Then one more time I came home, I was arrested again. I had on my ribbons, had on my uniform, and and what's his name? What the what the black cop name that used to wreck everybody? Jimmy Foreman. Jimmy Foreman wrecked me for impersonating a soldier. And he walked me from Rip from Mission Street to Bank Street. Walked me from Mission Street to Bank Street for impersonating a soldier. Never asked me to show him any identification or no nothing, just arrest. All right. So now when I get down there, same sergeant that did the rest the first time saw me. What you bring him in here for? What you bring him in here for? Jimmy Foreman said, impersonating a soldier. He said, he ain't no impersonator. He ain't no impersonator. He the real thing. There it is again. All apologetic, all apologetic. And I don't even make no trouble. All I do is get my thing and say, I ain't walking home. I'm not walking from here to Southfield Village. You're going to give me a ride home. They put me in the squad car and gave me a lift home. Them were the only two times I had. <laughs> but that was my part of my service life. And then when your service ended, where did you go? Huh? What did you do after your service? Went to work. Where did you work? I worked at for... Uh, Paper Novelty. Paper Novelty Manufacturing Company. I just want to do something. No, no, I'm sorry. I went to work for a car wash. I went to work for running a car wash in Darien. And, and I did that. I did that for uh, two and a half years. I ran a car wash. And after I ran, stopped running the car wash, I went to work for Paper Novelty Manufacturing Company, where I became a supervisor. And under that, I made four other supervisors under me. And that's when my workforce started. I always worked. Did you ever go back to Did you ever go back to school? No, I did. I did. I took a, I took a course at um, at um, UConn, UConn, Stanford, and it was a night course, and I was doing good, but I wanted to work, and the post office called me, and the post office called me. It was a night job. Now I can't go to school because I got to go to work. So I started working and never looked back. Did you uh, stay in touch with your... Um, um, only for about four or five years. Um, I got out of contact with Perry. I got out of contact with Lipcom. And uh, three boys from Detroit, I didn't hear from them anymore. And I haven't heard from them in, in about 20 years. Did you join any uh, veterans organizations? Um, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, a veteran. I was uh, a... Um, uh, um, 1040, 1040, 1044, yeah. 1046. Of the American Legion? Yeah, no, no, of the, of the VFW. Okay. And I was the, I was the, I was the American Legion too. It just that a couple of years ago, I stopped being American Legion. Would you say your experiences in the military affected how you lived the rest of your life?
somewhat, somewhat, in a way it made me stronger. It made me care more about other people. Um, uh, when I got out of the service, when I got out of the service, I started all. Uh, I'll tell you what the Army did for me. When I got out of the service, I started a group called the Kings. Called the Kings. I took 25 young high school kids and tried to make men out of them. Show them that they wasn't hoodlum. They wasn't, they wasn't, um, because if you didn't know how to treat yourself, you couldn't treat other people. I've taught them how to say yes and no, not how huh, and who, uh, what, pardon me, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat what you said? We gave to the community for the for the community center. We gave ping pong balls and 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 ping pong tables so that they would have something to play with, play on. And then in the holiday time, we took needy families and gave back to the food to the needy and to the needy. Uh, things like that we did until we broke up. Until they just got too old for that and we broke up. And But those things I did when I got out of service. And that was the service that did for me. It made me aware of and conscious of other living so they can do better. Is there anything else that you'd like to go over that I haven't covered in the interview? It was good time, but I, there were bad times too. There were bad times too. I remember in the service being called a nigger. And I almost killed a boy for that. I almost tried to throw him off the back of a truck for calling me that. But I got over it. Made me stronger, made me wiser, made me wiser. I've been in bars where I'm with my friend right in New Jersey, while based the training. Boy named, boy named, um, Satcher. He wanted me to go to his home, to his hometown bar because we was all soldiers together, but they wouldn't serve me at his bar. In the bar, he wanted to turn the bar out. I wouldn't let him do that. I wouldn't let him do that. Told me it ain't worth it. I don't drink beer anyway. I wouldn't even. Know, I was only nineteen. I wasn't an alcohol drinker. Didn't care for alcohol. Period. So I just went in there because he wanted to go in there. He wanted to show off his friend, him being in the service. But the situation started. But we walked out of there, and when we walked out of there, the bartender said, Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, you didn't let him tear my place up. Uh, what you like to have? So I told you, I don't even drink. So well, I ran across things like that, but it was all right. Well, I'd like to thank you for your service and for spending the time to tell my me. My pleasure. Today. My pleasure.